This is We Flew Off the Page. I'm Muhammad Seven, and I'm here to do my very favorite thing in the world. Talk to great songwriters about how they do what they do. In each episode, we'll dive into the little details of two of my guests' songs, which I'll play for you. Songwriter has chosen one of their songs, and I have agonized over and selected the other from their catalog of wonderful music. This week's episode is brought to you by Stuff You Found on the Side of the Road. Sometimes trash, but often treasure. Stuff You Found on the Side of the Road is always free and might turn out to be a piece of furniture that cradles your human body for 10 solid years, or a soft shirt that's your very favorite. Nothing's more satisfying than giving new life to an old possession, and what's more, something in that pile with a sign that says, take me, might inspire you to write a response to Macklemore's thrift shop. You can find stuff on the side of the road just about everywhere. I once carried a giant wicker basket all the way home on my bike, and I still have it to this day. If you'd like to support the show, there are a few great ways to do that. You can become a patron on patreon.com and get a more personal access to all of my work. That's at patreon.com slash Muhammad7, or there's a link in the show notes. You can also review the show on Apple Podcasts. Regardless of how you listen to podcasts, that's the way to help more and more music and songwriting lovers find We Flew Off the Page. And lastly, you can share it with a friend. My guest today is Peter Mulvey. Raised working class Catholic on the northwest side of Milwaukee, Peter has made 19 records, an illustrated book, has performed live thousands of times, has a wonderful TED Talk that made my head explode, a decades-long association with the National Youth Science Camp, and has opened for luminaries such as Ani DeFranco, Emmy Lou Harris, and Chuck Prophet. In late January 2019, Peter and his band Sister Strings, which is Shantae and Monique Ross, along with Nathan Killen on drums, made two records in five days in the tiny back room of the Cafe Carp at Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. The live album Peter Mulvey with Sister Strings Live at the Cafe Carp and the studio album Shenandoah. Peter Mulvey, welcome to We Flew Off the Page. Thank you so much for having me, Mohammed. I, I, I love this show already. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're off to a good start. So, uh, so I'd like to ask Peter, when did you write your first song? I was seven years old, and I had been to summer camp already and seen a camp counselor with a guitar, and I demanded a guitar, and I got one for my birthday that September, and uh, I immediately wrote this sort of like long narrative song that had sound effects, and, and it was called Cowboys and Indians. You know, one of those things that you... You look back on and it's sort of cute and vaguely horrifying in the way that all things are here in the 20th century. <laughs> uh, sounds amazing. Seven, I feel like, is on the young side for it. Sounds honestly sounds sophisticated for a seven year old. I mean, you and I are both parents now, and I just ran across someone who made the point that kids, when they're three, four, five, they're all imaginative. You know, mm -hmm. oh, I live on Neptune. And then six, seven, and eight, they're all about rules. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, you got to stand here and you unfreeze, but only if you say the, you know, the letter J. And that all art and all games and everything is a balance between creativity and boundaries. Mm. I guess I've always been kind of bad at boundaries, you know, like, well, <laughs> I don't have to strum and make chords like I can make plinky sounds over here and plunky thunky sounds over here and a narrative and I can call that a song. I feel like it's still a part of how I write, I think. Good mm -hmm. God, what a world. <laughs> Now that I'm talking to songwriters, you know, in this kind of depth, this is a thread that I'm noticing in, you know, the writers whose work I love is a certain unwillingness to, you know, abide by rules. So that's interesting. Yeah. That's really lovely. Yeah. Like to reject premises or leap. I mean, it's important to know those rules. Right. I, and study them. And then Woody Guthrie, you know, I, uh, I went walking, I saw a sign there. On the sign, it said no trespassing. On the other side, it didn't, didn't say, say nothing. nothing. <laughs> Best line of the song. <laughs> my, my favorite, too. I love that, where he's just like, just for the record, the other side of that sign was blank. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, to me, that's an interesting tension because I'm also often aware of the, the value of, of the limitations you know, yes. it's like as an artist, when you've got the whole universe to choose from, that can be overwhelming. But sometimes the confines of, of something more particular and structure can be so helpful. But I think it speaks to what you're saying about 
it's, it's a cliche, but I, I find it so true. Uh, it helps to know the rules in order to break them. And yeah. sometimes you can call upon them to give yourself structure when you need it. But most valuable probably is to be able to shed them. And Right. Right. I mean, there's something, you know, my kid right now is two and he doesn't know anything about boundaries or rules. He was gumming a piece of bagel with, you know, <laughs> or chewing a piece like, bagel saliva bread and peanut butter in a sort of a asteroid shaped pasty <laughs> lump and then suddenly he gets this look on his face and he puts the this disgusting thing to his ear and he goes hello <laughs> you know? right. and like that's raw chaos and it can be super entertaining but you know i i hopefully we just maintain our playfulness like it, it took me 20 years 30 years of doing this and a friend pointed out you ever notice that no one has ever said, hey, do you ever want to work music together? Mm -hmm. Like nobody works. You you play music. Right. right. Like you, you're, we're not here to work. We're here to play. Oh, I love that so much. What a, that's terrific. Speaking of uh, your little one, I'm curious, um, has parenthood changed your songwriting, either your process or the practice? Um, both. Uh, you know, the process, luckily, my process before was a lot like my process now, which is that I would just procrastinate and procrastinate <laughs> and then just dash something off fairly quickly and then make a few broad stroke edits to it and call it done or and failed or succeeded. I write a lot and they either fly or they don't. And I guess I'm the judge of it. Maybe some of the ones I think don't fly would if I just brought them out in front of a crowd. Sure. So that was the way I wrote, but now it's just, a heightened version of that. Now I write in these little bursts of, of like, okay, well, I got six minutes here. I don't know. Maybe something will come along. Sure. What was the other thing? It was the process and the... I forget what my words were, but you're getting at it. I guess I was asking about, you know, in terms of the time, where you find time and all of that I was asking about, but also was asking about, I, I, guess, I, I guess the second question was, has parenthood affected sort of the soul of what you're doing, you know, what, what you're writing about, etc. Hugely. And it's heightened it. I guess to me, the one tool that I use, perhaps overuse, is uh, the zoom arm, you know, the camera lens where I just zoom way the hell out. I zoom way in on somebody and their circumstances. And then I zoom way out, sometimes on a scale of millennial time, or just you know, nations and their goings on, you know, the environment and its perils. And what I've found is that that sort of foregrounds a human longing or a human need. And then when you zoom way out, it gives a little rush of perspective, like we are insignificant and yet significant. And that all is just larger now. If, if all goes according to plan, I, I became a dad at 52, you know, it seems to me very likely that my son will spend more than half of his life after I die. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm investing all of this love and all of this care, and I'm not going to know that guy. He's going to go on without me. And so, I mean, that's my topic. <laughs> you know, It's almost like all my writing was getting ready for that, of like zooming the camera back and forth and saying like, I love you, I'm right here. We're right with this person. Also, you are in a vast universe of, of absolute change. There's nothing temporarily going to stay. Good luck. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Just listening to you lay it out, like I could feel all of that so deep in my chest. How could that not be affecting everything you're doing in right. your songwriting? It's, and it's, you know, have you, parenthood is so profound but it's also so ordinary. Like there's a squirrel doing the same right. damn thing, 90 feet away, like stressed out, caring, uh, enjoying, snuggling, terrified, like all those things. They're just another thing creatures do. Like it's as common as eating and pooping is, is parenting. And man, it's like, I'm struck by that. I mean, I, I feel like opposites and the, the two sides of the coin of all the soul of things is often where the good stuff is in writing. Like, now I can't remember the Joni Mitchell line, but, you know, we are so beautiful and, you know, stupid all at the same time, essentially. Uh -huh. uh, 
Now, I, now I'm thinking of uh, The Book of Love by uh, uh, Stephen Merritt, The Magnetic Fields. Uh, some of it is just transcendental, some of it is just really dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to think that every song starts with what I'll call a kernel of inspiration. That mm -hmm. there's, it, and it could be anything. Sometimes it's an idea, sometimes it's a turn of phrase, it could be a piece of melody. Um, and I'm curious if for you that tends in a particular direction, if it often is a, a similar kind of kernel, or do you take, does it, can a song start really from, from anywhere? Um, so I would say that the two things that I, I tend to do a little bit of both. I have all these little scraps of mulch hanging around, uh, which is to say little phrases and um, I learned this uh, trick from uh, uh, a songwriter friend, um, Keith Sykes. He said, if you ever have a song that you figure you could write, give it a title now mm. and write the title down on the last page of your notebook. And so now, like, you know, because my notebooks, like everybody's notebooks, there's lyrics that went nowhere and lists, grocery lists and me venting about, you know, the imperfections of my friends or even worse, me, you know, like all that stuff. That progress now is actually toward a destination. And then you've literalized mm -hmm. the back of your mind. You have this growing list of the songs you figure you're, you're writing right now. And I swear to God, your subconscious gets it. You know, it just goes, oh, oh, you want me to turn all this progress into progress towards that. Cool. And so what I find is that they tend to take shape and then like some little scrap of melody will lead to some little phrase and then you'll go, holy crap, I'm writing that song. I'm writing, you know, that song. You flip the script on the process. That is very cool. It's, I mean, it seems to work. JT Nero said this super useful thing to me once. He said, you know that feeling that you get when you're really in it and, and the song is really coming along well and you, it feels like it's outside of you mm -hmm. and, and you're just taking dictation. And right. I was like, right. Like all, of, all songwriters respond, yeah, I know that feeling. And he goes, yeah. what if that's not true? Like, it's probably not true. A much, <laughs> right. <laughs> a much likelier explanation is that, you, you know, there's parts of your mind that you don't ever see. Like what part of your, you know, some part of your brain, your mind, your consciousness makes your spleen do what it does, <laughs> makes your, right. you know, your, your, your intestines do what they do. And you've never once been aware of that. What if some part of your mind you're not aware of? I, in fact, smart people came up with an idea called the subconscious. Uh -huh. What if that's what's happening? Wouldn't that be a likelier explanation? And I was, I was a little crestfallen. I was like, yeah, I guess so. And he's like, but who cares? I thought like, it was God, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> well, totally. And, but his point is, like, if you experience it as this magical thing that's happening outside of you, well, great. Right. Whose business is that? If, if you want to look at it that way. Right. Like, it's right. not even my business. Right. <laughs> I love that. I also enjoyed you calling it those the scraps. You called them mulch. Yeah. And I, I like that in particular because uh, a previous guest, Austin McRae, uh, his episode mm. will, will come out shortly. Um, he, I think he uh, referenced, I think it was Henry David Thoreau, who we were talking about, uh, you're writing a song and you cut things out. And yeah. you save you save those things though. You never yes. throw them away, right? And so Austin said that I think it was Thoreau calls this the lumber pile. So at the oh, end, that's, that's good, isn't that? A, yeah. And so I've been do, we've been doing this for forever, but I liked having something to call it. Now it's the lumber pile, and now I have it. it I come from I just came from a career in horticulture, so I particularly enjoy that I've got the lumber pile and mulch uh, right. to add to my my songwriting acumen here. So that's uh, very satisfying. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and mulch, I mean, it depends on what kind of writing you do. Like Thoreau was writing, you know, big, solid structures. And I'm, I'm very much like little organic bits of, you know, dandelion fluff. And so mulch makes more sense to me because I repurpose that stuff in that it rots on the floor of my mind and it turns <laughs> into topsoil. 
<laughs> which is frankly most of what my mind appears to be made of these days. <laughs> You have a, a long and deep relationship with uh, Sister Strings, mm, and yeah. I was a huge fan of your work uh, when you, um, a huge fan of the work you did with Chris Delmhurst and mm. uh, Jeffrey Focal as Redbird. I'm wondering yeah. if either of these collaborations, and I'm sure there are more, um, had a if, if any of those, if either of those collaborations had a particular effect on your songwriting. Yeah, I mean, Chris and Jeff and I went on this tour of England, and they were busy sort of falling in love with each other. And we were just trading songs. All the drives were short. And so we would get to the venue at like one in the one or two in the afternoon and have a drink in the pub and then just swap tunes until sound check. And we discovered there that between the three of us, and that's kind of where Redbird came from, like each of us knew a few hundred songs. Like <laughs> and that, you know, although our writing processes and our writing styles are pretty different. I think that the three of us share this thing in common that it's probably a good three to one, like, or four to one. Like if I have written two or 300 songs, I'm sure I've learned, you know, seven or 1200 songs. Like I've just learned many, many, many songs. Yeah. And, and that that becomes sort of a template. And then, you know, from Sister Strings, from Shanti and Monique, I, Oof. I mean, I've learned a whole number of things. I've I I love the I love how I went from mentee to mentor in about eighteen minutes. Like I was opening for Patty Larkin and Chris Smither and and you know Ani DeFranco. Like I was opening for these. Well, Ani's younger than me, damn it. But <laughs> you know, people further along in their careers than me. And then, fifteen minutes later, I had all these young friends, and. You know, in their case, I've never, I've never in my life seen people that bring technique and sort of looseness and joy and spontaneity together. Like that, you know, a classical cellist, a classical violinist, you, you, you that's such a tall order just to get a sound out of the damn instrument, mm -hmm. you know, and then to get the right technique, to get the right sounds. Like most people just. By the time they've learned that, they've they're you know they're in their forties, and these ladies appear they appeared to learn it in their teens, and also they came up in the church and and I guess the other thing I've learned from them is like uh, say what you want like they want to be big, and mm -hmm. so like you know they they did some touring with me and we made some records together. And then they toured with Alison Russell, and now they're touring with Brandy Carlisle, and Brandy <laughs> yeah, Carlisle's opening for Pink. Pink uh, right, and like, right, you know, right now. And I bet you anything that Pink is going to hire them, be like, you guys should play on my next record. And, and like, you know, they were very intentional about that. They were like, we want to dream really, really, really big. And, you know, at the same time, I'm like the curmudgeon who's like, buy a house, buy a house now <laughs> while you have earning power. You're black women in America, buy a house, you know, like, trust me. <laughs> oh, I love that. Um, any advice for new songwriters? Yeah, yeah. The, one of the most useful things I ever did was get into a little group with a couple friends of mine and just for a year we wrote a song every Tuesday. And it's a just a weekly song is a really good practice. Your 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 batting average goes down, you know, <laughs> like and you write more crappy songs, but your overall run productivity goes up. Right. And you you know, you get on a roll, but you also sort of you learn craft and you begin to learn the arc of things like I think this is probably true in all in all fields like you know when a when a, a chess grandmaster looks at a board all the pieces on the board and the position that they, they are in that's just kind of one thought to them and then they can think many of those forward you know in several directions and I bet you it's the exact same thing with a carpenter like, you know, like I'm I'm looking at putting up drywall and mudding and taping and like I'm looking at the each little, you know, I'm cutting a piece of tape and that takes a lot of my 
energy. <laughs> like, whereas they sort of see all one thing and can iterate that into the future. It kind of becomes that way with songs where you're like, oh, this song is one of those that came out of that drawer in my mind. And so the normal thing to do would be this. But if there's some instinct that, oh, it came out of that, that particular toolbox, but if I just turn it upside down and staple some feathers to it, it'll be, you know, it'll take off. Like that only comes when you've dipped into that toolbox 65 times, right. you know? So I think just write a lot, you know? I mean, what's the Picasso quote? Others talk, I work. <laughs> just just make art. I, I love two things about what you've said, and both of them are something that you've now reiterated in our conversation. One is the idea of volume, the value of volume. You mm -hmm. mentioned that personally, that's the way things go. You know, some people have an idea that songwriting is somehow magic. And again, and we, we also covered how sometimes it does come through you as if, you know, as if mm -hmm. a gift by God, but maybe your subconscious. And those are nice times, but that is rare that it comes through mm. you and it's good. 100%. <laughs> Sometimes it comes through you and it's more like something else that goes through you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but so, so, so just the value of, yeah, and the value of, of putting out volume both in terms of, you know, you write 10 songs and if one of them is great, that's a huge success, one out of 10. Yes. Yes. And, and the value of volume because the more reps, it's Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours, right? The more reps you get in, the totally. better you are at anything. This is a, you know, it's an art, but this is a craft like carpentry, like any worthwhile pursuit and what you put in, you get out. 100%. And it's funny, but as you, as you advance in any pursuit, I, I think you begin to notice that they're all the same. Mm -hmm. You know, like like my, my wife was uh, in her younger days was part of a lot of Im improvisational dance troupes. And there was a, a four part method that they came up with. And it was show up, pay attention, tell the truth, see what happens. Oh. And right. <laughs> That's, That's everything. cool. Yeah. <laughs> like, Great honestly, look at it. That's pretty good marriage advice. That's pretty good parenting <laughs> advice. That's pretty good career advice. Like it, it, yeah, we're kind of all just doing one thing. But of course, we're, if, if there weren't, di if there weren't di divergence and diversity within that, we would be so bored. Right. You know? Right. <laughs> There you have it, folks. Write it on a piece of paper and stick it on your bathroom mirror so you see it every morning. That was wonderful. Uh, and so, but and then I'll just add that the second thing I loved about what you what you just laid out, um, I hadn't thought about so much, but it is the 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 vision you develop for the process, where at the beginning of the process you're already locating the end of the process. And I suppose you pointed out the the simple way to conceive of that which is you've got a song and you start with the title which easily could be the last thing you put down um mm -hmm. because you know because how do you know the title in in some ways is the, the a summary of the song how do you know what the summary is of something you haven't written yet but it's it's so helpful to i i guess the way that i would think about it is when you've got when you start to conceive of a new song kind of doesn't matter where in the process you can you start to understand it. You got to write that part down. If there's some tidbit in the middle, you put that in. If it's the first right. word and you know it's the first word, don't skip over it. If it's the title, you start everywhere. Right. And and as you as you start to develop your process, uh, I, I love the part about you know writing at the end of your notebook and then filling in all of the all of the mulch. So yeah, mm. great. Yeah, time. it is. It's it's a delightful process. And then. Why do I procrastinate so much? <laughs> like, if, if this is as much fun as I say it is, shouldn't I have written thousands and thousands of songs? Like, why exactly are we watching Netflix tonight? Right. Oh, right, because we're exhausted out of our damn minds. <laughs> well, there's there's that. And also, songwriting also happens to be totally terrifying because every time you go right up against the, the reality and the possibility of your own human failure, or at least yep. that's how it feels to you, even though, you know, it's not really failure, I don't think. Right? Yeah, but I, I agree with you. Like you to risk, to risk a part of your own interiority, um, and then to risk, you know, just that you're not likely to write at a level of Joni Mitchell or Randy Newman today, or you right. know, Beyonce or Prince. Like 
you're probably not going to write something as great as the Beatles today. And that stops us all most right. of the time. Right. <laughs> Indeed. Well, let's jump into listening to uh, the song I have chosen of yours. And that is Just Before the War. We used to beat him up And when he cried It made us hate him more I mean Jesus Kids are awful Boys especially We used to taunt him All the way to his screen door But all of this Was just before the war town would get all lit up on a tall summer night the high school girls would smoke behind the store and if you could get a car you could go out and drive around drive down to the lake sit down by the shore but all of this was just before the war That's what they say But oh, you believe it When the world falls away go like they go You rake leaves You shovel snow Probably you're no different than before And the town still gets all lit up on a tall summer night The light shines down through my window to my floor As I think about the time before the war That was Just Before the War by my guest Peter Mulvey. So before uh, we jump into the, the, the writing of the song and, and, and the lyricism, um, I want to ask something else. So you um, have been on, I think, two different labels, uh, Signature Sounds in Western Massachusetts and are currently on Ani DeFranco's Righteous Babe Records. Yes. I have to say, to, to my terrific jealousy, the two labels I have only ever really wanted to be signed to. <laughs> That's so wonderful. Um, I've enjoyed following you from, from one place to the other. And uh, my memory is that Ani produced this record. Is that true? She did, yeah. I mean, I was immersed in that all of a sudden. I, you know, because my experience of the songs is playing them live every night. I don't often listen to my own records. And so... All of a sudden, you know, I'm hearing Todd, her bass player, uh, playing bass on this track, and he was playing the, the Fender Rhodes mm. keyboard, and I was hearing the great songwriter, Anna Tivill, who came to those sessions, and she's playing octave violin on this particular tune. So, mm. like, and, you know, just crazy, 
Oh, man, that, you know, it brought back, we were down in New Orleans in Ani's house. Yeah, which, I've seen the video. Oh, man. And and we had a great time. Like, she's a born leader. Sure. Ani, great producer. And, like, the, the five of us really clicked into a, you know, a pretty good, pretty good little unit. Like, we all had a good leader, and then we would just, you know basically set the stage for the, you know the 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 young ingenue songwriter although uh-huh. i was the oldest dude in the room uh-huh. <laughs> uh, um to like you know to to sort of take a swing at the at the at each individual tune i feel like we got that one pretty good oh yeah um it, it's um it's interesting it uh, th- listening to it this last time i for the first time sort of really heard the Ani DeFranco-ness of it. I fell in love with this song um, when I heard it on YouTube. Uh, it was the World One video uh, that you made yeah. on YouTube. It's just you playing in a doorway uh, yeah. and such a great take. And that that was, you know, it's like, I, I don't really learn about much music on YouTube, but that hit me like a ton of bricks. Yeah. And then the record came out. But it's interesting. It's like I can hear. So obviously, I sort of knew the Eunice of the song before I, you know, before I. And now I'm sort kind of letting in the the other artists, and in particular, uh, kind of the vision that Ani brings. It it reminds me going back to her Little Plastic Castles album. The robustness of the instrumentation. I mean, you know, those are they're very different records, and the sound is very different. But I think there's a way she thinks about instrumentation yeah, that is totally. so unconventional. And yeah. It, 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 it might, you know, I think under in, in someone else's hands, it might not inspire in quite the way that it does when she is, you know, adding what she adds. I think you've I think you've got it. Like she just has a way of thinking about these things. Also, she mixed the record like she Interesting. like, you know, she knows where she wants these things to sit, yes. you know, and and I love that about her, you know. Um, yeah. Oh, man. Remind me sometime to tell you the story of how when I was 17 years old working in a coffee house and she was still small enough to be playing coffee houses. I right. didn't, know, didn't know who she was. They closed the place down and brought me in just to cook for her. That's how I discovered her and then watched her set, which completely changed my life. And, right. and then I went on to like sneak into sold out shows. I was, you know, that level of obsessed. So oh, that's some, great. Sometimes I'll tell you these stories. But anyway, mm. back to your song. Uh, so so again, you know, I first heard it, the, the World One version on YouTube, which I'll include in the show notes as well for people in addition to the link to the album version of the song. Um, it's just one of those moments when you hear a song and feel like you've had a profound experience in the middle of an otherwise normal day. Um, and I'm assuming this is a character study. And, you know, one reason I love it is that we rarely hear from this character, the former bully who is now an adult. But not just any bully, you know, a seemingly blue collar guy looking back with remorse on the way he picked mm. on a vulnerable boy and facing the beautiful and painful realization that his victim had a power he couldn't understand at the time and that he himself had vulnerabilities that he also mm-hmm. didn't understand at that time. Yeah, yep. I find, all of that. I, I find all this so touching and you know, masterfully crafted in the song. I'll add a story of my own here, which is that I went to a high school reunion, must have been my 15th, some time ago, and found myself surrounded by a group of people I barely knew, you know, very few of those who had been my friends came. And I was standing by the doorway when a guy who had bullied me walked in. And uh, you know, he could have looked at me uncomfortably and walked right by, but he smiled and stopped to talk. He was, as I expected, he'd be as an adult, was a su- successful, uh, well-dressed, and he had a few kids. And there was something about that. I found it hard to hold on to my anger. I found it hard yeah. to hate a guy who was now a father and was clearly, you know, spreading a good amount of positivity in the world. Yeah. And, you know, it helped me let go of some of my anger that I carried towards him, you know, still well into my 30s. Uh, so anyway, back to you. I, I guess my first question is, uh, why did you write the song? But you're welcome to say anything you'd like. I've just said a bunch of things. Oh, no. This, I mean, it's, it's, this was a very personal song for me because I am both of the characters. Mm, mm. I, um, you know, I, and 
this one was kind of eerie. Like, I always had that line, we used to hate that little fucker. Mm-hmm. It's, and it's a startling line. I, have, yeah. I cannot count the number of times that I have played the introduction and sang that line and someone in the audience laughs. Sure. Because it, it's startling. Sure. Like, it's an unusual place to begin a song. And, and, and you know, it's not comfortable. Like, nope. it, it's like, he's just saying it. It's um, so honest. But, yeah. And it, I mean, I think the reason that you responded to the video was that video was recorded in September. And I think I wrote the song in August and it was new and it was wow. raw. Wow. And so, like, I still was sort of inhabiting it and trying to figure out where it had come from it was you know we 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 spend so much time on craft and writing and sometimes i feel like our whole mission is to get ourselves in shape so that when a song arrives the way this one arrived because this one just plopped into my mind i was driving a car i didn't have to stop the car you know like i knew what the chords were going to be i knew the melody It, it was like hearing it on the radio like I I didn't have to stop. I just I was in Baraboo, Wisconsin. I got to the venue and I just played it. It was already written. I it felt like someone else wrote it. But, hmm. you know, obviously going back to our the likeliest explanation is I you know, I've suffered I've suffered from depression all of my life, like since I was a little kid. Uh, and it runs like wildfire in my family, schizophrenia, major depressive disorder, alcoholism, you know, like, we, you know, the, the battlefield of, of my upbringing sort of on the on my father's Irish uh, peasant side is just littered with casualties. And mm-hmm. and uh, and I had the great good fortune in my early 20s to be going through, you know, yet another one of my deals and to have a few friends, like I had an alcoholic friend say, you know, it's a goddamn shame you're not an alcoholic because I know a place we could take you <laughs> and get you all straightened out. Um, but he, you know, he and I have talked quite a bit about alcoholism and quite a bit about the human mind and the human self. So I had him and then I had another friend who basically dropped a book on me called Mindfulness in Plain English. Hmm. Uh, And that was where I got into uh, meditation, which has been a fairly large part of my life, like a persistent half-assed part. Like I'm not a (laughs) go to a retreat and don't speak for a week kind of a guy. Mm -hmm. I'm a, a, you know, when I'm really rolling, maybe three to five days a week, I'll sit for 20 minutes before anyone anyone else in my house gets up. Okay. And of course, obviously, that's taken a big hit lately with the emperor who has moved in and started, <laughs> you know, pooping and disrupting everywhere. But um, in studying the mind, I went through, in studying my mind, which is just a mind, I went through what a lot of people go through, which is at first you have this big relief and you're like, oh my God, meditation feels so great. And then a month or three in, you're like, my mind just went crazy. What the hell? It's talking all the time. Mm-hmm. Where's that? And that isn't actually what's happened. What's happened is you have begun to listen carefully enough that you are recognizing that what a mind is on some levels is this recursive engine of judgment and mm-hmm. criticism. Mm-hmm. Like that's what the human mind is. Mm-hmm. You know, and it needs to be. That's how we got here. Don't eat this, eat that, you know, uh, reproduce with that one. Don't reproduce with that one. Like, uh, avoid that creature, domesticate that creature. Like, I get it that we have to be judgmental. But the mind is the most towering bully you're ever going to find, you know. Mm -hmm. And you, the sort of innocent you that's just trying to, I don't know, get love and give love, is often the re- at the receiving end of the worst, the worst stuff in the world. Like I, I, my buddy Rajiv once was working on something on his laptop in his office with his other coworkers, and 
out of like it's silent in the office and he goes oh, i'm such a fucking dumbass because he realized you know that he could have done something some way and immediately one of his co-workers said hey hey don't talk that way about my friend rajiv uh-huh. and that stuck with me forever like our our inclination to be brutal to ourselves mm-hmm. is with us whether we notice it or not and so like and then in my case, I think it's probably just amplified a little by the neurochemistry of whoever the hell I am and whatever the hell I put together, you know? Like, I had a great childhood. My parents were very loving, but they had four sons. They lost their temper sometimes. They got loud. I got scared about that. But, you know, I I have a very imaginative life, and I have a very cerebral life, and that makes it very easy to hide in a little dungeon that you built for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so this process, writing this song is essentially about the two characters that I have always been, you know, the the bully and the bullied. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, that old saying, no one's harder on you than you are on yourself. And, you know, all the things that are true of bullies remain true. Like if and and to to make peace with yourself is a noble thing and i guess we should all work at it and maybe you get a little bit better as time goes on but this part of me i guess will always exist and you know it's all a waste of time and this part of me is just sitting alone in its room having bullied <laughs> You know, and doesn't have any friends because, honestly, who likes somebody who's that critical? (laughs) (laughs) And so, you know, it's awful and it's sad and it can be told exactly as a character study. Right. You know, like, it, it, you just, I don't know, and I, no part of me set out to do that. Like, the town, interesting, all of that, it just, like, came together and I think it's because of all the times that I had unsuccessfully tried to be honest with myself or a shrink or my first wife or, you know, my my brothers, my parents, you know, like you, you try to say something, but you can't because, you know, you want to be the good child or you want to be the or or whatever it is that prevents you from telling the truth. You're still driving at telling the truth. Right. And then if you're lucky and, and you've built a songwriting mechanism, I think in some ways your broken, broken heart just goes, fine, we'll do it in a song. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Those of us who have chosen chosen this life. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's right. It's a vehicle for, for I mean, I think we're all desperate to both to, to hear the accurate word and to, yeah. get to, to say the accurate word. Yes. Um, right. And then like. Like, I'm glad I wrote this song. I just hope that I don't precipitate my son playing out any part of it. Mm. And, and, and I will, you know, yeah. like, I can't not be me. So, like, I'm going to bring some of this to him, I'm, you know. But, like, at the very least, I know that my parents were in that struggle, and I am in that struggle. And that's if he right. becomes a parent, he'll be in that struggle. And that's enough. That's cool. Yeah, I'm, that's right. I'm, it's good to have company. I, I it is it, sadly it is the greatest sadness of my life as a parent, to to in, actually to watch this in particular on my son. You know, certainly the the uh, whatever you want to call them the the the, the worst of ourselves that we we try not to pass on, but do do anyway in spite of ourselves is always hard mm-hmm. to watch. But for me and my son, he's so hard on himself. He's ten years yeah. old. And and it's the it's the thing that I um, have the hardest time uh, accepting, and you know, and then it's like he's hard on himself, and so what am I going to do? Tell him to not be hard on himself? He has the same struggle I have. What I've right. come to find is the the best I can do is to try to communicate something like, "Well, we're in this one together, honey." Yeah, yeah. And we'll find also, our way out together. I love that you call your son honey. Like <laughs> I, I I I met a guy who referred to all of his sons as honey and sweetie and you know etc and i was like i'm doing that i'm cribbing that that is so good you know? like, oh, wonderful. Oh, i'm so glad man mm. so um 
as you've laid out, there is there's an inner life of this story. Kind of the whole story could be metaphor, even though, and this is from a songwriting perspective, so wonderful and so interesting. You didn't sit down and say, "I'm going to write a story. That's a, I'm going to write a song. That's a story." But the story is a metaphor for this, you know, profound inner truth that I want to express. You didn't do that. You let your subconscious feel its its feelers out into the world and then one day this is the thing that came in and you wrote it down but at the same time as having this rich inner life this song it also i find myself wondering like it could have played out at any time in history and mm -hmm. i find myself wondering what's the significance of the song happening just before the war which is the title of the song and can i tell you my guess about sure about yes. so because so I guess now I'm speaking to the story of the, the literal story of the song since it is a character study and you know is there's a narrative, and so my guess about this element about why it's just before the war, um, it, it it made me think about the lines when you bring the little fucker line back so it's a big line and you manage to bring it back one second time in the song, and that is uh, that little fucker was brave, turns out I wasn't. And you learn what that means and what it doesn't. To me, this mention of the boy's bravery, it, as far as story goes, it felt like an, a very elegant way to suggest that he probably fought and died in that war. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it sounds like our protagonist took a different route. So, of course, this is my inter interpretation as the listener. I, I'm, I'm curious if you thought about it in a totally different way and... Uh, if this if this dimension of it mattered to you or, or, or what the significance significance was of of being situated just before the war. Right. I, I think narratively, you're exactly right. Like that's the the sort of Occam's razor mm -hmm. of that line. Um, and it's probably what I was thinking narratively. But I don't remember. I don't remember. I was, you know, like I was just I was kind of vomiting. You right. know, like, th like this was just coming up out of me. Right. But yeah, like, you know, in a war, you have the unfortunate thing of learning whether or not you are brave. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and bullies tend not to be brave. You know, right. there's there's not I mean, there's nothing brave about a bully. That's, That's right. It's it's sort of anti bravery. Right. So it's it actually scans with and reads with our own common sense. That's right. Um yeah, I, I will also say, again, like everyone I know that has ever made some peace has made some peace after bruising themselves in their own wars. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, who's the, the great Pema Chodron said, there's only one question. Are you going to war today or not? Wow. And I love that, you wow. know. Uh, what's his nuts? Um, Eckhart Tolle said it the exact same way, but kind of lower key. He said, um, suffering is necessary until it isn't. <laughs> you know, like like most of the drunks I know that got sobered up, yes, they had a profound struggle, but also they just got so tired of being drunk all the time sure. that they were like, I just can't, I'm tired. Like, I gotta just do something different, you know? Um, Whatever that is, what was what was Richard Pryor's incredible formulation? I quit doing drugs because I got tired of waking up, running down the highway, <laughs> naked, with my car keys stuck up my ass. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, whatever your level. Uh -huh. uh, you know, and in my case, like it's so quotidian and middle class. But that was my war. That was my giant struggle. It's like, you know, what if I just was a little less self-critical? Just maybe. I could, you know, because I'm already living this really good life. I'm, I'm a middle class guy. I present kindly to my my family. I present kindly to my audiences. Like, wouldn't it be nice if we just tweaked the interior so it wasn't such a hellscape? On a on a you know on a, like, hmm. And one more. I'm sorry. I'm a quote machine, but no, um, Plato had that one. Be kind to those you meet for they are invariably engaged in a difficult struggle. Mm -hmm. You know, like 
some people's struggle is that they, you know, got super drunk and uh, put a car through a plate glass window and killed five people. And then they have to deal with that. And some people had a perfectly normal life, but they just felt crappy all the time. And they had to go down into the roots of their own shame or their own dysfunction to figure out why they felt crappy and rewire themselves. And if you can't respect both of those things, you don't respect human struggle. <laughs> I, think, I think this is so important. Beautifully said. Mm. Let's move on to uh, the song that you have chosen. Uh, our next song uh, from my guest, Peter Mulvey, is the song Mailman. The mailman came The mailman came Thank you for the book of poems And for your little note I did like it said And I started with the one On page 23 I have heard this one before And it's beautiful It's beautiful Especially the part about the tree Beautiful And so I went inside And I made some tea and I listened to the man on the radio He was telling us how it's all gonna be And he was telling us where it's all gotta go And I have heard this one before And it's beautiful, but it's a pack of lies Especially the part about what God wants But it's beautiful Standing by a hole in the frozen ground But my little niece has lost another tooth And today the air is warm and the blackbirds have returned And I have heard this one before And it's beautiful, it's still beautiful Especially the part that we can't quite name So beautiful Once again, that was Mailman by my guest Peter Mulvey. I really like this song uh, for several reasons. First, I have to ask, is that Chris Delmhurst on harmony vocals? That Yes, that is. Good ear. That is exactly who that is. She's got kind of an unmistakable lilt, doesn't she? She does, and she has that. The other thing I love is she's so sure-footed. It's like watching Jackie Chan. Like, it's just, like it's <laughs> so natural. You know, right. oh, disgusting. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. I haven't had the pleasure of getting to watch her in the recording process, but I met and discovered Chris for myself when I was 20 years old working at Bella Luna Restaurant in Jamaica Plain. Oh, and wow. That was back when she just had the cassette tape. Right. <laughs> and, and my job was to remove the chair from the corner so that she could squeeze herself and her microphone in. 
And, oh, wow. and even back then at that early you know stage of her career, blew me away. I, I must have bought 10 of those cassettes to give as gifts. I, I loved her work so much. Um, so anyway, fun to hear oh, there my God. on the That's track. That's great. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so glad you wandered into my life. Uh, so, but so um, let me ask first, well, why did you choose this song? Um, I because I love the way this one happened. I did a run of shows with Chris Purica. Um, and then, you know, we talked. I love going on the road with someone because you talk about your influences and this, that and the other thing. So we did this yeah. run of shows. And then like about a month later, she sent me a book of poems by Tony Hoagland. And I like, you know, went down got the book out of the mailbox. I was like, oh, that's nice, you know. And then went in and made some tea and <laughs> turned off the radio. I went upstairs and I wrote, uh, you know, Dear Chris, the mailman came. And I just set down the, the pen and picked up the guitar and kind of continued writing a thank you note to Chris Purica, but in the form of a song, you know, mm. like... I, something told me like, dude, you might as well, you're already going to write these words, just stick a melody underneath it and, and you'll have a song. And then you, and then I went back and wrote the note and like, you know, that's always been a thing now between me and Chris. Hmm. Um, and it's all true. Like, um, there was a poem, uh, that she had marked, uh, uh, she, it, I changed the page number. Uh, I think that that poem is actually on page 11, and 11 just doesn't sound as good to me as 23. Like, you it know. happens all the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like it, it's 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 so funny how different, accurate, and truthful are once you mm -hmm. get into the nitty grit nitty gritty of writing. Like yes. you know, accurate does not matter. Right. Until it does. Like, obviously, you shouldn't have a seasonal bird, uh, you know, out of a bird shouldn't be out of season. Like, right. you, you, you know, we, it is not apple picking time in April. That's just not a thing. <laughs> and that'll jolt people out of it. But if you pick 27 apples or 39 apples, the one that sounds right, that's what you need. The thing that's true. Right. So, it, you know, like she I had heard that poem. Before And I also loved immediately how that line, I have heard this one before, it applies to jokes, mm. it applies to poems, it's, oh yeah, yeah, I've heard this one before, but it also applies to those sort of moments in life, like right. the moment where you realize, all right, people die, people are born, we're all temporary, yeah, I've heard this one before, like, good, <laughs> good. <laughs> right, so it's fun to hear that this was a note that became a song you know first thing i noticed was that almost nothing rhymes in the song yes which is unusual and and it mm -hmm. I, uh, it i re i think takes a special talent um it's interesting my, my, the last the first interview i did uh, was with a woman named mira uh, who is a great miriam tov a great uh mm. kind of folk punk indie artist from the West Coast now in New York and and her and I was looking at lines of her song that also didn't rhyme and were wonderful um, so I, I tend to think it's unusual but now I'm noticing more and more that <laughs> the talented songwriters really really do it and can do it and I wondered at first um, if it's you know you're talking about a poem and and poems often don't rhyme and so it's like yeah. oh and now this song doesn't rhyme and now there's a third dimension oh it was a note not a poem or a song to begin with and it became probably both a poem and a song in the process uh, it, right exactly like I, and i'm often drawn to those kinds of poets like mm -hmm. among my very favorite poets would be mary carr and uh mary oliver and um billy collins um um Let's see. Uh, Tom Hennon is my very favorite. And what they tend to be is deeply colloquial. Right. They they write kind of like they're just writing you a little note. Right. You know? Until it ruins you. Yeah, exactly. And then you're like, what just <laughs> happened? <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. I think those are my favorite poets as well, that, that style. Oh, sweet. Yeah. So, so Na Naomi, let's just say Naomi Shihab Nye, like Titan. She's a Titan. 
I, I don't know her. I'm going to have to investigate oh, her. You're going to have great. to. Yeah. I what just wrote it? down, uh, what was that name you just said? Uh, Mira. Oh, Mira. Uh, so uh, musically, she just goes by Mira. Gotcha. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll share it with you. It's also, uh, okay, cool. if you check out my first episode, it's it's all in there. So oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, one thing, uh, another thing I like about this song is the way that it takes a small moment and finds so much richness in it. This is something that I'm really trying to bring into my own songwriting, which tends to be kind of epically narrative. Mm -hmm. Those are, mm -hmm. th that's what I trade in. Um, but I love the idea of finding moments and small moments in life and and exploring and excavating the the richness in a way that it's like we can all relate to these little moments. It, it, I think I, I came up feeling like like this was kind of navel gazy, like, you know, that, that it was feeling self important to consider the minutia or the mundane in, in in your own life. And I think I'm starting to realize there's a different wisdom in it. So anyway, I like how you did this here. Any any comment on all of that? Oh, yeah. I, like small moments can be absolutely everything, you right. know, and and there's a book. I feel like every songwriter should have this book. It's it's a book of poems, but they're all three and four line poems by and it's called Braided Creek and it's written by um uh, Ted Couser and Jim Harrison, and they don't take ownership. Like the right. poems are by one or the other of them, and who knows? But like one of the poems goes, uh, chipped porcelain cup of shadows near the headstone. Must we drink? Like it's just an object, uh -huh. you know? Like it, that's it. It's an image. Right, Little... but there's so much in it. And you're, yeah, totally. Or um, <laughs> straining. Straining on the toilet, we understand how the firefly feels. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Like like little, the littlest thing will tell you everything you probably need to know. Um, so what if the ladies no longer smile to see me? I smile to see them. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> boom. You know, yeah. like, it, in some ways, those slip into our minds more easily. Like, don't get me wrong. I admire novelists. Uh I've I've been thrown open by novels, but I, I don't think I'm ever gonna even be capable of working on that form. You know, like right. I I feel like I'm just I'm I'm already stuck in the condensery. I'm just condensing stuff down to these little shots of, you know, espresso or gin or whatever. Right. So it's interesting to learn that again that this started. It, you add, kind of as a thank you note uh, to a friend for 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 sending a book of poetry it became it also became something else it's an exploration of beauty three ways first you get mm. a, a book of poems from a loved one and you explore the beauty of poetry and the way poetry captures other beauty like you know that of the natural world um, second are those ideas that sound so beautiful we want to believe them but in the end right. are lies designed to prey on our ignorance and our pain. And the yeah. third is the beauty that we barely understand, like that of birth and death and the cycle of life. So how did how did that pivot happen in the cuz because it doesn't seem like it was in, in its the, the the original situation didn't contain that exactly or it did con it contained the multitudes clearly, but how did yeah. you how did how, how did you take that direction and why? I think I think it's because uh because once I get a thing, like, you know, I've heard this one before, and it's beautiful. Ah, right. I, I think I've I've been through the motions so many times that there's a part of me that's like, okay, good. I, I know what's next. Uh -huh. Some <laughs> other thing where it's like, I've heard this one before, and it's it beautiful. It's beautiful, right. Because you want to hear gonna, that multiple times. That's, that's right. a, a gorgeous nugget. But we want to pivot. Like, right. you know, like, I don't want to say the same thing. I want to say a very different thing. Right. And right, that exact thing of like, your basic televangelist, you know, I mean, that stuff is amazing. I love Christianity. I love Islam. I love Buddhism. But, you know, Shinto's flew airplanes into aircraft carriers, mm -hmm. and they meditated and prayed to get there, mm -hmm. you know, it, during World War II. Mm -hmm. I, I'm... We don't need to go back to World War II. Right now in Myanmar, Buddhists are like burning Hindus alive. On and on. Like, I, ah, like these ideas are really beautiful. And they're, they're just a, 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 a pile of nonsense 
largely Bronze Age, and it turns out we've learned a thing or two since the Bronze Age. You know, we, it it turns out that like uh, infidels are just people, and yeah. if you hurt them, they feel as bad as I do when I get hurt. So maybe. God doesn't want you to hurt them, you know, like on and on. And so, and I, and like, I take that, I just take that shot one further than most people do, mm -hmm. you know, like most people are very willing to recognize the fallacies of the belief systems that are not their own. Right. And I try to take that one thing further, you know, uh -huh. like, like, for example, well, here, for example, I, I notice that in this world, uh, it takes a lot of love to raise a special needs child. Mm -hmm. I know a couple of families raising a special needs child. Yeah. And one of them are, you know, probably... They have values like I do, you know, like largely sexual, secular, largely humanistic, you know, and they do a great job. And then the other family that I know, they are, they're fundamentalist Christian people. Mm -hmm. I have finally reached the point in my life where I think that the fundamentalist Christian people are going to fill their special needs child's life with love and a bunch of fundamentalist Christian nonsense. And that the secular family is going to fill their special needs child's life with love and a bunch of secular nonsense. Yeah, right. And I'm, I'm good. I'm just going to step back and go, the love was the only part that mattered. That's right. They are walking a tough road. Right. And, you know, and I'm done. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Of my four grandparents, uh, a Jew, a Muslim, a Catholic, and a Protestant. So I have a very mixed religious heritage. Oh my God, how do you sleep? Yeah, like, are, are you well, just having large debates all day? <laughs> I'll tell you, it took, I mean, it took, my, I'm 45, took my. Uh, took a long time to make sense of who I am. I'm also, you know, mixed, I'm a person of mixed racial heritage. You know, this is a, a lifetime of, of digging deep. Um, but, uh, I, I bring it up because um, in Islam, there's this idea that I, I find very interesting. It's the idea of the closing of the gates of ijtihad. Ijtihad is, um, it is the Islamic notion of interpretation. In other words, the notion that you have freedom to interpret the text and the scripture and the religion that came before. And there's an idea in Islam that the gates of ijtihad, the opportunity for interpretation closed at some point. And that there's no longer room for interpretation. Now, of course, not all Muslims think this or think this way, but this is this is this this exists. This idea in Islam, and I actually have a song uh, called "Springtime in Aleppo" that I've never recorded and actually never played live, but it talks about the closing of the gates of Ijtihad. And to me, this is so interesting. You know, these religions that have, have used, as you're pointing out, have so much value to offer to us, but also were created so long ago. And, mm -hmm. you know, some of those things may have been right then and are, and are no longer relevant. Some of those things were probably not relevant then and are still no longer relevant. But to right. me, the, the issue, you know, it's like there's, there's a lot of love for religion and zeal. There's also a lot of hate for religion and blaming of religion for, you know, the, 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 the terrible things in the world. And, you know, I, I love the notion uh, that you know, we all are free to interpret that we can take, you know, it's like sometimes when you take the parts you like from a religion and don't take the other things, people call you uh, not a good whatever it is that you are. And I feel totally. so differently. I feel like that's all of our obligation to interpret and to ask big questions. And, you know, there's, you know, you don't need to be religious if you don't want to, but there's no need to throw it away if it's in your heart, if it's in your heritage, if it's in your culture, you it's get to great, make your own exactly. decisions. Right, it's a great language for talking about things. Right. It's a it's a great boat. You know, the religions are great vessels to navigate the waters of reality. Right. As is science, as is frankly, you know, just being sensory. 
You know, there's a lot of ways to do all this. I remember talking once to a, a, a you know, a devout, uh, fundam- you know, a born again Christian. And, you know, he, he was after me because, you know, I'm not like I and from his perspective, he's worried about me. He doesn't want me to go to hell. OK, cool. You know, that's cool. But uh, I, I was trying to explain to him why I'm not, a, a, you know, a fundamentalist Christian. And I, I said, you know, I was watching a PBS show about these elephants and this, you know, one of these elephants got stuck in the leg with a spear and the the wound went septic and she had a little daughter baby elephant and the tribe of elephants realized we you know we don't we can't save the mother but we can save the baby and so one day they made the decision when the when the mother had become too restricted in her mobility and they dragged this poor child away from her mother oh and God. they're screaming it's i'm crying watching yeah. this a year later they come back to her bones and the the child now grown you know picks up the bones and hands the bones around to the and tears are going down <laughs> her all of the elephant's faces <laughs> totally oh and and the guy you know and uh the guy says so are you saying they were having a human experience i said no they're having an elephant experience <laughs> but they don't have you know Nothing we say at a funeral really gets at the the mystery that that someone we loved was here. Now they're not here. Whatever here is, they're somewhere or someone else, and we don't get to know what that is. And we're sad about it. And the only reason we're sad about it is because we still love them. So apparently, love gets to go to those places, but we don't. Mm. Like, you can say that very simply. I see why people came up with scripture, because <laughs> it's, more, it's more complicated than I laid out. In some ways, it's, it's no more complicated than that. Like, love, love transcends time. That's just that, you know, like, I don't, I don't believe in a self. I don't believe in, in, I don't believe in the reality of my senses, but I believe in love. You know, if it were as simple as that, I guess I would never have had to have written a song. Now would I? But I did. (laughs) I had to. Well, to finish out the show, uh, we'll each share one cool thing something that's piqued your interest or uh, even something you've been mildly obsessed with that you think our listeners might enjoy. Uh, I'll I'll start. Mine is a TED Talk by Ethan Hawke called Give Yourself Permission to Be Creative. Have you seen this? No, but I'm going to now. (laughs) Yeah, you're going to love it. It's recent. Uh, And um, Ethan Hawke is, I think, around my age, you know, of my of my generation for sure, of uh, of, of of moviegoers, and uh, I, I heard a wonderful moth uh, episode of Ethan Hawke talking about his childhood as the only child of a single mother, which I could relate to, and um, and so you know have have felt a, a certain affinity to him, but he gives this wonderful um, impassioned kind of treatise on. Um, the value of creativity and the gift of creativity and you know how it belongs to each of us it's a, it's a relatively uh, kind of common statement that he manages to deliver in an uncommon way so uh, easy to find on youtube give yourself permission to be creative nice all right i'm looking that up um my one cool thing is that i live uh in in the greater northampton massachusetts area oh and, and there is out here, uh, an organization called PEDAL, P-E-D-A-L, People. And they handle all of the municipal garbage collection for all the little trash cans around town. And they do it all by bicycle. Wow. And they have these like 14 foot long trailers and you can put two stacks of Rubbermaid crates, like so for a total of 18 Rubbermaid crates on them. And they haul all the trash from all the little garbage cans around town and you can pay them and they will come to your house on a bicycle and take your compost and take your recycling and take your trash and go to the town dump 
And it's like, I just love that it, it occurred to someone to do that. And of course, it's a great business model. Bicycles mm -hmm. are cheap per mile. Right. And, you know, like, I bet you not one of the people that works for Pedal People has a gym membership. Uh -huh. Why would you need it? <laughs> you know? so, right. And, and, you know, yes, I get it. It's a lefty, hippest, leftist, hippie thing. You know, like, that's how leftist and hippie the town I live in is. But I don't care. It's a fantastic <laughs> idea. Good for you. That's right. <laughs> so cool. Well, Peter Mulvey, it was so great having you on the show. Thank you. It was so great talking to you. This was this. I'm so glad this conversation happened. Like, I'm glad to be on the show, but this this is a conversation that I needed to have. So thank you. Where can people find you? Oh, um, well, of course, at PeterMulvey.com. And, uh, you know, I'm 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 just always out there making records. Uh, the latest uh, project, I don't know exactly when it's going to come out, probably late in 23. I'm going to put out a record of um, just my own songs without a band. So songs from about the last 15, 20 years, just me and a guitar. That's going to be called More Notes from Elsewhere. It's a companion piece to a record I made maybe in nine in 2000 something, eight, 10. I don't, I don't know when these things happen anymore. And then the other thing is I, I have a page, Patreon page, like a lot of people, you can find it at my webpage. And I, sometimes I run songwriting circles there, which can be a lot of fun. But the thing that I think I'm going to do over the next few years is to try to move more and more of my touring onto bicycles and trains and uh, buses and less in cars and airplanes because it's been a nice 30 years of cars and rental cars and airplanes, but I don't need to do that anymore. Uh, and especially with a young kid, I'm trying to become more regional. Right. And so if I can just ride a folding bike down to the train station in my town and get to New York, Philly, DC and then be home on Monday to get the kid, you know, to to daycare. Well, that that'll be good. So you can find hopefully all of this stuff at, at petermulvey.com. Well, once again, I'm Muhammad Seven. You can find me at Muhammad7.com. That's M-U-H-A-M-M-A-D and S-E-V-E-N like the number. There you can find my music, tour dates, uh, as well as how to get in touch if you're interested in songwriting, coaching, or lessons, which I offer. Uh, if you'd like to support the show, I have a Patreon once again. You can become a patron via the link on the website, or I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, if you'd like to, I'll also put all of Peter's links in the show notes, by the way. Um, if you'd like your ad to be featured at the top of the podcast, just email it in. You can find my contact info in the link tree and all the We Flew Off the Page social media pages. We're always eager for new sponsors. All right. Uh, well, I'll see you back here next time on We Flew Off the Page.